Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Inner Balance TV, and I'm your host, Dwayne Hartman. What if there were technologies that we already own, we already have? What if we could travel to any place at any time? And what if those technologies were actually being used right now? We're taking these flights to Mars to investigate the, investigate the surface. But yet, there are people that say that they've already been to Mars. That they've been involved in a group that travel to Mars and have traveled to Mars in a project called Project Pegasus. We're going to hear a very interesting interview tonight with Andrew. And in this interview, we're going to hear some things that may enlighten you a little bit as to how far along our technology has advanced. And in fact, it's been more advanced than we know since even the 40s. And where Tesla technology has taken us. So let's move on to the interview with Andrew. Well, hello, Andrew. It's nice to have you on Inner Balance uh, TV. Uh, thank you for coming. Hi, Dwayne. It's good to be with you this afternoon. You have had a, an amazing life experience um, with what's happened in, to you with being teleported. You've, you've actually went to different places, different times. Um, and and this this was through the the Pegasus project. Is that correct? Right. I I'm 51. I've actually had a very mundane life, but I, I have had eight years of very non ordinary experience. First four years in childhood serving in Darkus Project Pegasus, uh, which was the U.S. time to space program at the time of the emergence of time travel. And then during my college years at UCLA, I served in the CIA's Mars Jumper program. So. I'm really just an ordinary lawyer practicing in Washington State. I grew up in New Jersey and came up to Beijing, California, uh, and now I'm practicing law in Washington. But what I've done is I've gone back and investigated what happened to me in these two very significant defense technical projects. And I, admittedly, I, I had I now appreciate and this is in fact one of the reasons I came forward. I had really extraordinary life experience in those two projects, and I, I believe that the that humankind uh, deserves to understand what we did in those two projects. Because here we are uh, going to Mars with probes and you've already been there. Yes, in fact, I first went to Mars via jump room from a Hughes aircraft facility in El Segundo, California. I don't have the precise date, but it was the month of July 1981 when I was 19, right. after having been trained the previous summer of 1980 uh, to go. So here we are, it's 2013. Uh, 32 years have passed since I first went there, and I was by, by no means the first Mars jumper. Right. Well, I played more of a pioneering role as the first American child to teleport during Project Pegasus for a complicated number of reasons. I may have been the 100,000th or so American to be sent to Mars by a jump or to believe what my class was told during our training in the summer of 1980. So we were sending a lot of people. Yeah. Because I've heard you mention on other interviews the, the, the numbers of people that are actually there. Well, David Wilcock uh, um, is a bright physicist and, and a, a fairly uh, cautious researcher, and he estimates that there are now as many as 550,000 earthquakes in the secret U.S. colony on Mars. Right. Uh, Going back to the early 1980s when we were trained at a, a seminar at College of the Siskiyous held by the CIA 
to prepare us for our trips to Mars beginning the next summer, the summer of 81, we were told that of the um, 97,000 individuals that had at that point been sent to Mars, only 7,000 had survived after five years. So those must have been the individuals that they were attempting to settle on Mars in very brutal conditions. Okay. So um, I think literally the secret Mars program may explain many of the missing uh, adult person cases in the country. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In the late 70s, because a lot of people have been sent. I mean, half a million people is, is a small city. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Vancouver, Washington, I think we have a population of 100,000. So right. that's as many as had, almost as many as had been sent when I was sent in July of 1981. And there's, there's facilities there. There's, you, uh, I remember hearing uh, Jessica Mystic, a friend of mine, she interviewed you. And she, I, I went through the whole and listened to the, the whole interview. And, uh, and you had mentioned about, about when you went there, there's already you know, a facility there, there's a, a bunker. Um, there were a set of, of jump room receiving facilities that were relatively small buildings. Uh, they weren't tiny, and they weren't just the size of of the jump room. But if you can imagine about the size of an auto dealership, you know, where you need enough floor space to maybe put out eight models of car. Right. Uh, and there's an elevator maybe up to a second floor where there's some sofas or whatever to sit around and talk to the salesman. It was sort of that size of the building. And those housed the elevator that received the jump room that had been sent there by the elevator on Earth. Uh, and there were four or five of those, but there weren't the large cavernous buildings that, for example, there's a photograph that uh, my good friend Robert Odin, the ufologist, shared for the first time mm-hmm. at the European Exopolitan Summit in Barcelona, Spain, in the summer of 2009. And that that building is about the size of, let's say, a library at, at a major university, you know, a major university uh, research library, let's say. And it's a sprawling facility, and, and and Bob Dean understands that that's one of the U.S. facilities at the present time on Mars. Mm-hmm. But when we were going up there, we were pretty much fending for ourselves in a quasi-frontier environment. Because while the defense contractors involved, which I know was the Ralph M. Parsons Company, because I was the son of a Parsons engineer who was on on the project, and I at one point we saw actually things that had been done by engineers and construction workers under the direction of Parsons, but also Hughes Aircraft. Um, they had built some of these jump room facilities, but the rest of the surface of Mars was relatively uncultivated by by human hands. I mean, there were a lot of ancient structures and artifacts, uh, primarily from the Martian civilization before the solar system catastrophe of 9500 B.C., okay. which are still on the surface. But in terms of contemporary facilities, that we could have sought shelter in. I mean, the only time that happened during my 40 or more trips there was I was caught in a dust storm with Courtney M. Hunt of the CIA and and my young fellow jumper, William B. Stillings, and we kind of waited out that dust storm in a rudimentary um, uh, sheet metal or aluminum sort of hut, kind of like a Quonset hut. Okay, yeah. There were a few facilities like that, but we were often... Um, in completely exposed conditions where, you know, twice I was standing within footsteps of one of the Martian predators that was devouring one of our team members. And although I had a flash gun, kind of a handgun on me, to fend the smaller predators, that weapon would be of no use against the larger predators. It was simply too big. And we were simply, I was simply talking to the predators, you know, have, you know, come over and don't, you know, if you come over here, don't eat me. You know, that was pretty much just exposed to the kinds of conditions that frontiersmen and women are exposed to, which would be, you know, conditions of great thirst without water, mm-hmm. conditions of hunger without food, the risk of dangerous, of being eaten by, da- or killed by dangerous predators, of stepping on things that could injure us, a snake, uh, a tear of some kind. Um, were you were you in suits, or were you, can you, can you just walk around in the environment there? When I first went up, um, I had received some specialized training after the basic sort of cognitive or educational preparation in summer of 80. 
Then in the summer of 81, I was given actual operational training and things like how to operate a respirator on the surface, how to use my weapon, um, when to use the cyanide capsule that I've been given as a suicide pill mm-hmm. if I faced inevitable uh, death as a result of, of being within the proximity of one of the inevitably lethal predators, uh, different ways of orienting myself on the surface, and especially we were essentially Pavlovian conditioned to look around every 30 seconds. Okay. We were trained sort of like combat infantry to look in this direction to the left and then do a 180 and look behind us and then do a 90 degree turn and, and, um, and just make sure that we were not within range of any of the predators, including the non-lethal, you know, inevitably uh, or potentially non-lethal ones. Um, so the first time I went up, I had that respiration device but I was met on the surface by three American chrononauts like myself who were up there. And I was interacting with one, one of them in particular, <clears throat> and I was yelling that they had, they had no respirators on. And I was yelling, can I take off my mask? And they were laughing, and I did, and I could, I could breathe on the surface. Okay. Wow. You, <coughs> you had mentioned... Uh, a couple of times now about these predators. Are these like bur- burrowing predators? Like they're, I've seen some images of somebody had had taken some uh, video footage of these, of some sort of uh, worm-like or burrowing. Uh, is, is that exist up there? Or is it? There are, we were trained that there were, or there, there are 30 large land animals on the surface of Mars. It's a very flat ecosystem with a lot of predation going on. And um, five or six are predators. I mean, they'll eat earthlings or human, you know, primates on the surface. Um, but only several were inevitably lethal. And the two that, that I saw were the same species. They looked basically, they were about 16 feet tall. They looked like dinosaurs. They had heads like Tyrannosaurus rex with just as much teeth and just as jagged, but a narrower face, a narrower head as you look on from the front. Mm -hmm. And they had very supple, muscular bodies, very much like the Velociraptors, velociraptors, uh, depicted by Steven Spielberg uh, in Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. They were very fast. We saw one of them running at a speed estimated at 70 miles per hour, suddenly stopping and devouring a water buffalo-like creature on the surface. This was still hundred yards you were watching was just scream across the surface. And when those would scamper in to a group of us, we had been trained that if they focused on us, we should run in erratic zigzag patterns because they might tire of chasing us and just scamper off. And both of the team members did that and ultimately sat down and then were bitten and devoured. In, the first, the fact, in fact, the first was a... Uh, about a 45-year-old man, and he was actually bitten in half in front of us. Mm-hmm. The second casualty was a was a teenage boy from Southern California who ultimately sat down and was bitten. Um, so these were probably not dinosaurs. They were probably large reptiles. I say that because the plesiosaur species on Earth, which has a bulky body like a tortoise and a long neck like a snake, did not survive the KT extinction on Earth. But there are many plesiosaurs on Mars. In fact, I've shown them in my Mars photo analysis, for example, in my paper, The Discovery of Life on Mars, um, published in 2008. I showed three Martian plesiosaurs, or what I'm calling these terrestrial, as distinguished from the aquatic plesiosaurs on Earth, that are on um, Silkovsky Ridge, west of the home plate plateau. Okay in the Columbia Basin of, uh, of the Gusev Crater of Mars. So Mars is a mix of, I mean, there has to be common genetic heritage from either Earth or whatever produced life on Earth because the species that, on, that are on Mars, the animal species, include species that are presently on Earth, mm-hmm. that were once on Earth and are extinct, or that have never been on Earth that we know of. I mean, basically unidentified species that we can't recognize and then also hybrids of both living and extinct Earth species. So when I make a reference to the Martian plesiosaur, I'm suggesting 
an animal like the aquatic plesiosaur on Earth before the case of extinction that is adapted to a, to a terrestrial environment. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that kind of mimicry. For example, there, there's one hybrid that I didn't see on Mars, but I found in NASA image PIA 10 14 that is a hybrid of the upper torso and head and shoulders of a human being, a modern Homo sapien on Earth, and the lower extremities of a modern scorpion on Earth, but with the size of the lower extremities of a modern human, human adult on Earth. So, and we've seen some, the, some of that imagery in ancient work and ancient stonework and, and, and that of a man scorpion. Yes, in fact, the, in the high Egyptian pantheon, Serpent, who is the goddess of the harvest, or was the goddess of the harvest to the Egyptians, holding up a mysterious red orb that we believe is the planet Mars, um, is is a female, uh, and, and she is a hybrid between uh, her uh, upper half is an adult female human form, and then her lower half is that of a scorpion. So mm -hmm. that's the result of some cultural diffusion between uh, Mars and Earth back before 11,500 years ago, when the high Egyptian civilization still existed and was uh, in regular contact with the planet Mars. Now, this is interesting because um, w at one time there was some sort of communication or jumping that was going back and forth uh, at that time, I would imagine. We know there was because we not only have the pioneering work of Hoagland, Bear, and Munch in studying the Sidona complex, and seeing that it corresponds to the same Orion constellation-based form of the Giza Plateau in Egypt, encompassing the Great Pyramid. Um, but my organization, more recently, working not from the satellite data, but from the rover data on the, on the ground, uh, our, our analyst, Ross Curley, found an intaglio in a Martian rock. In fact, oddly, it was found on Sol 2012 mm -hmm. uh, by, by the rover Spirit. Uh, of our mission on Mars with the modern, uh, you know, Mars Exploration Rover, Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity, Ross found a perfect image of an Egyptian pharaoh carved into the rock. It has the typical conical headdress of a pharaoh, the uh, cobra ready-to-strike motif at the bottom center of the, of the headpiece, of the headdress, and... Um, uh, a beard at the bottom of the chin, which is how the pharaohs were uh, appointed in terms mm -hmm. of uh, their appearance. And this particular pharaoh possesses both European and African phenotype, basically physical appearance, physiognomy, uh, much as the president does. President Obama is both of European and African ancestry, and you can see in his features. Well, this particular pharaoh, this is a very interesting find, because there was a period in the high Egyptian civilization where the Egyptians began adopting the children of the most successful warriors of the Ethiopians that they had contested in battle and took them into their specialized academies and groomed them for the leadership of Egypt. And so there was a reign of black pharaohs, mm -hmm. which I think shows a measure of the advanced uh, nature of that high Egyptian civilization. Yeah. So we found not only a pharaoh, I mean, if we were faking the data, uh, we would have made the face look more like the pharaohs that exist in a lot of the statuary and iconography of, uh, and, and hieroglyphics of the high Egyptian civilization. But in fact, it's a, it's a legitimate finding, it's an authentic finding, and it shows a black pharaoh. Mm. So, we now have the fingerprint. I mean, we're referring to that as the, as the Rosetta Stone of the high Egyptian presence on Mars because it's not a close call. It literally looks like somebody carved the face of a pharaoh uh, and then stamped it into a piece of metal. It's that clear. Wow. So, um, uh, yeah, it's certain at this point that there was, in all likelihood, an interplanetary confederation between Earth and Mars, maybe in league with a third planet that fragmented, and that may have caused both planets to be devastated in that catastrophe of around 9500 BC. I mean, that that event fractured Mars, it squished it into a, a, a spheroidal planet, more oblate than the planet Earth. Um, it devastated the biosphere of Mars. It led to a huge flood that left a lot of the planet under mud mm -hmm. that dried and, and, and caused Mars to become a desert planet. 
it knocked off most of the ionosphere of Mars, which is one of the, of the reasons that the several typologies of Martian humanoid live underground, because their their skin is not adapted to a terrestrial environment that's almost devoid of an ionosphere. So Mars is hit uh, constantly by solar radiation that can be deleterious uh, mm-hmm. to, to the skin. But that also devastated Earth. That was the that was the event that led to the Hopi creation myth born of water. I mean, the earlier creation myth was Dragon Slayer, mm-hmm. the event that in all likelihood uh, caused the dinosaurs to become extinct. But the, the very recent catastrophic event that sort of led to a, a new flourishing of a new world on Earth as human beings recovered over many thousands of years, roughly from around 9500 B.C. to around 3000 B.C., when civilization then flourished in ancient Sumer, which is why we call the most pleasant season of the year in the Northern Hemisphere summer, and is in reference to ancient Sumer, kind of a golden age where civilization then recovered after 6,000 years of relatively advanced human beings living in in, uh, in caveman conditions for that, for that epoch. So we're certain now that before that event, the previous Earth civilization centered in Egypt. It was actually a, a great maritime civilization that had major uh, major outposts in Mesoamerica and in Southeast Asia, and possibly in Eastern Europe. Um, that uh, that that first civilization on Earth that built the Great Pyramid of the Sphinx was on Mars. Mm-hmm. We have found its artifacts on the surface. This is amazing, eh? You have you. Have you, because uh, I know not only have you jumped to Mars, but you've also went back in time. Is that, uh, have you ever gone to Egypt yourself? No, no. I, I, I went on prehistoric and ancient and medieval kinds of jumps via chronovisor and also by a technique called plasma confinement when I was in Project Pegasus as a child. But most of the places we were sent to were fairly mundane. The only really illustrious Time space locations I was sent to is I was sent to the Gettysburg Address to try to see Abraham Lincoln give the Gettysburg Address, and for a very complex set of reasons I didn't. Uh, and I was sent to Ford's Theater the night of his assassination, and I was sent to brief General Washington, with the latter two events being via chronovisor, which is this electro optical device that creates a hologram from which you be in a past or future uh, location. Okay. Uh, but I, I I really wasn't sent to any of the places that would have interested in Edgar Cayce. I mean, I wasn't sent to ancient Egypt when the pyramids were being built or to ancient China when the Great Wall was being built. I ripped my, my time travel experiences were, were training exercises, so they didn't want to place us in very stressful environments per se. Yeah, yeah. That would just dis- disrupt our training. Why do you think that they, they use children? Well, I know why they used children in private places for time travel. The first reason, uh, I mean, I've, in the 10 years, the now 13 years I've been investigating my experiences, I've, I've, I've identified the specific reasons because I was either told when I was trained or later by my father or I figured it out. But the first thing we know is that they were testing tele- Tesla teleportation mm-hmm. uh, on bright, healthy, sturdy children from stable families, just as, the, for example, the children of the president would likely be. You know, when a man reaches the White House, usually he's accomplished enough. Most of our presidents have been have raised healthy children, mm-hmm. if, if if married. Um, and um, so they were planning on integrating Tesla teleportation into the national security system, namely place it at U.S. military bases around the world to shuttle the president and his family, and the vice president and the cabinet itself around planet Earth without any fatigue, so that, for example, Air Force One could take off and the President would be shuttled to the local military base, maybe Andrews, by car, teleport to, let's say, England, and then the plane would land at Heathrow, but he would actually be at a local military base having teleported there in seconds. That was, it was hoped that that would enable our executive branch officials to carry out our foreign policy and our diplomacy. <clears throat> without the danger posed by things like jet lag right. or an accident in the air. So we know that the first reason for using children is they were testing uh, Tesla teleportation to gauge the cognitive and physiological impacts on children 
around the same age that the typical first family children have been. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, the second reason is that the holograms and the quantizers, which again were these electro-optical devices that produced a hologram so dense that it had the effect of lensing, typically a past event, into the laboratory. Mm -hmm. Now, when the chronovisor program began, the holograms that they were producing were so vulnerable to collapse, just like a, an early television picture could go on the blink, right. they were so likely to respond to a noise, let's say somebody coughing or sneezing or saying something, that they found that the, the biological signature of an adult, namely heavier footfall, louder respiration, a heavier heartbeat, you know, louder heartbeat, and louder noises, like when talking or sneezing or coughing, were causing the hologram to collapse. So they knew that if they were going to use the chronovisors to perform quantum access, that is to, to use it as a technical remote viewing device to either look at what was going on in a past or future scene or send a chrononaut there to experience that environment directly as a result of being immersed in the hologram, mm -hmm. that they, did, they made a decision that to train a cadre of gifted and talented American school children who were cooperative personalities and who, could, who were quick studies and who would um, have the courage and the capability to be immersed in the hologram and go to these primarily past locations in time. Because when I joined the program officially in the fall of 1969, they had, they had not yet pushed the limit forward uh, of the quantizers of trying to get scenes from the future. They were already setting us back 12, or excuse me, 12 hours in time uh, when we test the teleported back from New Mexico to New Jersey. But the chronovisors were still an experimental technology. So the second reason is they needed to use children, or they wouldn't have the benefit of the chronovisors for their intelligence mission, which was remote sensing in time, mm -hmm. to give the intel American intelligence community the better information that it needed so that it could make intelligence recommendations to the rest of the executive branch of the U.S. government to engage the government in better contingency planning for current and future events. The third this, reason, oh, sorry, reason, sorry. Yeah, reason there's, there's actually five reasons. The third reason is that we were trainees. They were planning to send us along to the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis after high school to involve us in more time-space travel. So we were basically not space cadets, but time-space cadets. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth reason um, is that they knew that children have very keen perception so that as participant observers in the program, when we sensed something in time, when we looked, for example, at what somebody was hol holding in a holster on their belt, if it was a scientific instrument rather than a sidearm, the children would see that it was a scientific instrument, but adults would just sort of scan it quickly and presume it was a weapon. Oh, okay. We were viewed as tabula rasa, as blank slates, who would be able to give the CIA uh, better information based on the time probe that DARPA was running us through. And then finally, uh, later uh, in time, toward the end of his life, uh, in the late 80s, my father revealed that they had decided to train a cadre of children from childhood because when they were using adults, for example, Navy enlisted personnel, after several experiences time traveling, they were often going insane. Yeah. because of the psychologically de effects of moving between times. So we were essentially being um, involved in time travel as youngsters in the same way that, let's say, if you teach a child how to scuba dive in childhood, by the time they're in their teens, they're doing it as second nature. It's a natural activity right. Right. in terms of their worldview. So they were making time travel an ordinary activity for us so that when we grew up, we could cope with its effects. Right. I, I, that's that's the part I thought probably one of the reasons would be the psychological uh, flexibility of children to be able to see something like that and not be you know adults would be would have a little bit uh, tougher time. Right, right, exactly. Children are malleable. They don't know what they can't do. Yeah, 
exactly. and they believe what they can do. And so on a certain level, um, on one level, it was a matter of utilizing that human potential of children. Mm -hmm. Children, for example, more than adults have demonstrated things like levitation of small objects mm -hmm. because they believe they can take their intent and move that object in the same way they can take their intent and reach over and lift the object. But after around age seven, when the critical faculty begins to characterize human cognition and the brain begins to differentiate and develop more cranulation, more wrinkling, there seems to be a loss of capabilities that are either vestigial potentials of the human, of the human race or incipient ones. We don't really know. We don't know if ancient man was levitating more than modern man or whether future man is going to be doing things like using the human mind to achieve these kind of feats right. uh, more than the typical uh, contemporary human being can. But I was both reading minds and I was levitating small objects as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I know I was doing those things because I believed I could, 100% of certainty. Right. Exactly. And so that was a dimension of, a, of the program, was the innate special abilities of some children. Now this was, pro is this Project Looking Glass, is that what what you were? Glass is, was either a later program or it's just uh, a different name for the chronicizer dimension of Project Pegasus. Okay. Project Pegasus was under DARPA and involved eight different modalities of time travel. And we know for certain that one of them was spun off into a separate program, and that was the Montauk Chair. Okay spun off into Project Montauk about 15 years after Pegasus began. The Montauk chair is simply a magnetic transducer that boosts human consciousness forward in time so that people experience a 15 to 20 minute episode of their own subjective future. Okay. Now in the case of the reference to Project Looking Glass that Dan Burrish established in his testimony to Project Camelot, because the Montauk chair was spun off, if there was a project looking last, it would have involved spinning off the chronovisor, mm -hmm. which had already been in use in Project Pegasus. Okay. Hmm. I, I was sent to the past by a chronovisor to different settings. I mean, I was sent to 100 million BC, at the time of the dinosaurs. I was sent into a Civil War battle. Mm -hmm. I was sent to the Five Points neighborhood of New York City in 1905. I was sent to the Netherlands, in a rural setting in the Netherlands, around 1800, and to Washington's encampment uh, above New York Harbor in August of 1776, to Ford's Theater the night that Lincoln was shot there, and so forth. So I became well acquainted with chronomy. It was in major use in Project Pegasus um, when I was a child on the project in the late 60s and early 70s. What's strange, though, is when the two men operating these closed circuit TV camera like booms who were emitting some kind of signal across the hologram when they were focusing the hologram. When they would leave their positions and go to lunch or whatever, the, the, the hologram would just cycle through random images. Sometimes it would even go outside the facility and then run along the ground and then make a left and then go into another time and you'd see another another scene come up. In other words, it just it just circled through or cycled through random time-space locations. And that, that was pretty fascinating to watch. I'll bet it was. Eh? <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, you'd see, you'd see something from the colonial era in New Jersey, and then you'd see a car whisk by, and then it would make a left turn, and you'd see some kids from the 50s playing baseball out in some community park, and then it was just amazing. And, but this, was, this was... On a, on a particular place to send us there, which they could do with great, with great efficacy. But when they just left the equipment, it would cycle through a random scene. Something. Oh. And this was all birthed out of tes Tesla technology, was it? Well, according to three principals on the project, namely my, la my late father, Raymond F. Bishago of the Ralph M. Parsons Company, by Dr. Robert Beckwith, formerly of General Electric, and Jack Pruitt of the United States Navy, who was one of the uh, team leaders in Project Pegasus, and who went on to be the research director for Project Montauk, the, de the greatest debt of gratitude owed Project Pegasus in terms of the derivation of, of its technologies that it was working with, its time travel technologies, was the work of Nikola Tesla. The papers that Tesla had left upon his death um, in New York City in 1943 
were first sent to the National Archives under the Alien Property Act, but we know that from the National Archives, they were then forwarded to Los Alamos, where the world's leading physicists were then gathering to build the atomic bomb under Project Manhattan. And there his paperwork stayed, and the bomb project and Tesla's time travel papers were essentially the basis for founding the Los Alamos National Laboratory, first as the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory that had built the atomic bomb. Tesla's papers are still there. You need a special security clearance and, a, and a, an articulable reason uh, to have access to his papers, but they're still there in Los Alamos. So in my work, I've revealed that essentially the U.S. time-space program, founded in the work of Nikola Tesla, and having operationalized different forms of time travel to the past and future by 1970, was essentially the secret twin of Project Manhattan, and the greatest debt of gratitude was owed to Tesla. But also, there were inputs from ancient technological sources, from contemporary foreign technology sources, namely the Nazi German and Soviet Russian, and then also from other contemporary geniuses like Ernetti and Gemelli, who discovered Panavision, Fermi, who joined their team and helped them perfect uh, second uh, dimensional Panavision, which led to third and fourth dimensional Panavision under Project Pegasus. And um, also, I, I would be remiss not to add a major input from extraterrestrial sources. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, Project Pegasus was essentially the defense technical funnel where all those technical inputs were being put, but from the perspective of the principles on the project, when the project was underway, the project was essentially the fulfillment of the work of Nikola Tesla, 25 years after his death. So in, in a sense, I view my work in time travel advocacy, I think, in whistleblowing about what we have accomplished in Project Pegasus, as essentially the bridge between the completion of Nikola Tesla's work by Project Pegasus and the application of some of these technologies to advantage humanity in the 21st century. Right. You know, when I cross over to the other side, I want to shake Nikola Tesla's hand because this is what I'm doing, what I'm doing, what, why I'm doing, what I'm doing. I mean, I want to cut the red ribbon at uh, Nikola Tesla Grand Central Teleport in New York City. You know, he, he's the man. I mean, Tesla's work was repressed when he first came to the United States because he had uh, he had solved a technical problem that Thomas Alva Edison had posed, and he went to Edison to pick up this $50,000 reward for solving the problem, and Edison cheated him on that bet, all the way through the manipulation by Edison and Westinghouse. Mm -hmm. Nikola Tesla's work was repressed at the time it emerged and he became very defensive at being exploited for warfare purposes. Mm -hmm. So during that last 15 years of his life in New York City, where ostensibly he was just raising pigeons and sitting around in parks as a, as a doddering old man, in fact, secretly, he was developing the technology that's going to define the 21st century. And it's my mission to bring that information forward so that every child on Earth can teleport in the way that Nikola Tesla intended. In teleportation, have you have you teleported to other planets? We were being repositioned from Earth to Mars during my college years in the early 80s under the CIA's jump room program. But not only did I not go off planet when I was a child on Project Pegasus, but the lunar program and and Mars only came up in the most passing ways. So, for example, um, <clears throat> I was shown data from Project Moon Dust, where we, would, we were planning to put rockets on the moon and then bury them and make habitat under the, mar under the lunar surface with our rocketry. Um, I was, it was suggested to me by my father and some of the other principals that many of us would become astronauts. Um, there was one, I believe it was X-ray satellite imagery, it may have been radio satellite imagery, and I have that wrong, but I thought they said X-ray satellite imagery that showed odd images of four little Martians jumping off of a rock on Mars and allowing themselves to be devoured by a large serpent, because essentially they were cornered. And I don't know why we were shown that when we were children on Pegasus, because we were never told per se. I mean, one time we were doing 
a kind of a tolerance test. We were in that whirly bird device where you're thrown in every angle to you right. and they and they try to ascertain whether you can deal with yeah. with disequilibrium and not and not vomit basically. Well we were put in one of those and one one of the little girls went through it without getting sick to her stomach. She jumped out of the apparatus and said, Does this mean we're gonna be astronauts? And they said, Yes, some of you will be. So I think there was a plan to forward some of the children in Project Pegasus into the space program. But I know they were planning on sending many of us, continuing to involve many of us in the time space program because there was a discussion between Donald Rumsfeld, who was then the former congressman, who was the defense attache to Project Pegasus, basically the, the point man between the project principals like my father and the Department of Defense. And Rummy was telling my dad at a bar, I mean, he was having his martini, my dad was having his Jack Daniels, and I was having my great knee uh, that they were planning on sending us all to Annapolis to use it as a pretext for involving us in future project activities. Mm -hmm. So I think that is kind of their thinking. Now, also, one of our fellow Mars jumpers went on to join the astronaut corps, and that was William Cameron McCool. Uh, Willie, Willie became a space shuttle pilot in 1996, when he and I were 35 years of age, that was going on 15 years after the Mars jump. Mm -hmm. So there was some, and also of course Regina Dugan became the director of DARPA. She was one of the Mars jumpers. Probably some of those jumpers had also served in Project Pegasus, but certainly in our peer group, I was known as the only jumper who had previously served as a time traveler in, in Pegasus. So these programs kind of have overlaps like that. Yeah. You, really, you really never know what the government has up its sleeve in terms of what what is planned for you. I think in my case they were, because I was sat down and told that I would be applying to Annapolis when I was in high school by my father, I believe that they wanted to send me to the Naval Academy to either train me to become a Naval officer or continue project activities or maybe both. Mm -hmm. when, I see, when I see the planets, you know, each one of them in basically the same sort of destruction or uh, farmed out or whatever. Is anybody ever looking at Venus, the next planet? Well, you know, Ben Rich of Lockheed said that whatever you think the U.S. defense technical community might someday be able to do, even in hundreds of years, I'm kind of embellishing what he said. He said basically, whatever you imagine you think we can do, we can do. We can even take ET home. Mm -hmm. So I believe now, 30 years after they were jumping us to to Mars in a space elevator that had trans properties that defied contemporary laws of physics that are still being taught at the high school and collegiate level. Um, I believe that our personnel are now outside the solar system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exchange programs like Project SIR program almost inevitably happen. Yeah, yeah. And I say that because look at where time travel was in 1970. Yeah. I mean, and in the sole photograph to capture Lincoln at, at Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. We were going to an elevator at 999 North Sepulveda in El Segundo, California in 1981, 2, 3, and 4, and standing in an elevator and stepping out of that elevator on the surface of Mars. So in the intervening going on 35 years here, in a couple of years, I think Ben Rich was basically being honest that we have very advanced technology. And that's, that's another reason I'm speaking out, Dwayne, is if we don't harmonize the knowledge of these activities with general societal knowledge and activity, what has been spoken of as a major threat to our civilization, namely that we would evolve into a breakaway civilization where there would be a priesthood of individuals involved in specific technical activities, and then the general public around the world would be kept in the dark. I mean, I don't think that's a threat. I think that's happened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The President of the United States, Barack Obama, was one of my colleagues in the Mars Jumper program. He's the same age peer that I knew as a friend and colleague. He's a fine individual, by the way, but we knew Barry, as we then called him, as one of our team members in a secret space project 30 years ago. And now he's been elected twice. He has been honored with the Nobel Peace Prize, and he's certainly one of the signal personalities of my generation. And yet the, the, the global public doesn't know that he's a veteran of secret space exploration activities by the United States that were premised on technologies that 
contemporary society would be in, in the realm of science fiction. Right. So I think that breakaway civilization has already formed or is in the process of forming. Mm -hmm. You really need to to make the truth movement um, to the kind of metaphysical oppression we're under from state secrecy, what the abolition movement was regarding was regarding the physical oppression that was embodied in slavery. We have to make the truth movement the leading cause of our time. Yes. So that we can reharmonize the connection between government and society and between individuals and society. When you when you speak of the Martians and you speak of the these people they want this too for us? Like as far as as coming back into you know this awakening to who we who we truly are really. Actually this is one of my favorite topics in this area. It's very it's very complex, so bear with me. Okay. The the, the jump room building in Ostendendo wasn't the uh, Hughes Aircraft Headquarters building in Ostendendo, but it was then owned and operated by Hughes. Howard Hughes was supposed to have died in 1976, but we now know through the work of investigator Mark Music and the author um, Douglas Wellman uh, in their book Boxes, The Secret Life of Howard Hughes, that there's overwhelming evidence that Hughes faked his death and that story of him becoming um, basically uh, a disheveled, um, sad figure of an old man there in the mid and late 70s, that he faked that through a double and that he lived the remainder of his life in Alabama with the woman that he married. Changing his name, believe it or not, to Nick Nicely. <laughs> now, of course, to Nick people nicely is to do well in business with a smile on your face, right? right. That sounds like the, the Howard Hughes joke. But I have some non-public information about Mr. Hughes, and that is, I don't want to mention her name, but she's asked for anonymity, so I've just shared the information. And that is, an elderly law client of mine in Vancouver, Washington, was a private secretary to Howard Robar Hughes at the El Segundo, California headquarters building of Hughes. And she stated that in the 1970s, when he was still quite strong, in other words, she didn't see any evidence of his decline. This would have been in the early 70s. There's no evidence that he'd become disheveled and, you know, was deteriorating physically. He came to her desk and said, Rose, I'll give you her first name is Rose, Rose, some men are going to be coming to your desk this afternoon with parts for me, with aerospace parts that were wrapped up. They're not from this planet. And by that, he meant the men. Be polite to them. He, he said something like, be polite to them. They're not from our planet. And, and graciously accept the parts that we're going to drop off at your desk. Now, we also know, again, that Hughes covered up his death, that they were using the story of the Glomar Explorer under the Summa Corporation, to kind of tout the really far out stuff that Hughes was doing towards the supposed end of his life. So I think that part of the Mars jump room cover up is probably that especially since Hughes was in alliance with the CIA for a long period of time. I mean, Hughes was traveling around the world with specialized telephones that could not be traced that he had been provided by the CIA. He was in possession of those in Latin America. So the kind of sidebar story that I'm describing here is relevant. It goes to what really happened to Howard Hughes around the time that the jumping to Mars were emerging. Because we know from the account of Michael C. Rell that Michael first took the jump room to Mars in 1976, the very year that Howard Robar Hughes was supposed to have died. So if we look at all the evidence that his decline was fake, the bountiful evidence that, that uh, Mark Music and uh, Doug Wellman have developed showing that he assumed uh, a false identity and lived another 25 years, dying in 2001. Mm -hmm. And we look at the fact that Hughes Aircraft has its fingerprints all over the Mars Jump Room Program. I think that the genius behind the Jump Room Program was Howard Hughes personally working with his aerospace engineers in direct liaison with the Martian human ones. Now you said, do they favor this as well? Well, we know that that human typology of Martian humanoid. These would be the descendants who live on Mars, who are in all likelihood the, the progeny uh, or descendants 
of the Earthlings who were on Mars at the time of the cataclysm and then built an advanced civilization under the surface. Mm -hmm. We know that that typology of humanoid exists because my father and I met three Martian astronauts in the summer of 1970 at an air base in New Jersey. They look like us. Their lung capacity certainly looks a lot bigger. They're very barrel-chested. But they look like modern humans. But their skeleton form and their musculature, as I could discern it as, as, a, as a nine-year-old in the summer of 70, is definitely a departure from our form. Again, they have large heads, large lung capacity because they have large chests, and so forth. But they were operating craft that was certainly more advanced than anything we had at that time. Mm -hmm. So they favored, or at least at one point, they favored liaison with us. And certainly by, still by 1984, that group and none of the three major typologies of humanoids on Mars were in any way interdicting our efforts. But there is some negative data. What's the negative data? When Barry Obama, Regina Dugan, and I were put into a sequestered environment in the summer of 80 during our training and asked to read through about four inches of French intelligence reports in French on the uh, what, what French intelligence had gathered about Mars and the Martian humanoids. And we were asked to um, come up with a thesis as to whether the Martian humanoid civilization presented, did not present, or we could not determine whether or not it presented a threat to human life on Earth. Regina Dugan was very bothered by the fact that there was an anecdote in which we had put, put some uh, of our astronauts in some location on the Martian surface. We had contacted the Martian humanoid civilization like us to rescue them. They had promised to rescue our personnel, and then they they reneged and our personnel perished. We also have the shoot down from Phobos of the Russian probe Phobos II in 1989. Now that was via a rocket sent from the surface of Phobos. <coughs> so it looks like we can't presuppose or um, assume that the Martian humanoid civilization that's related to us still favors our activities on their planet. Maybe after we were going up there in the early 80s, they determined that our hegemonious use of their territorial domain to protect Earth was contrary to their mm -hmm. global security interests. Mm -hmm. Second typology are the more diminutive Martians. By the way, I call that first group Homo Maris Terrace because they're, 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 they're earthly men and women on Mars. The second group are the ones that are smaller, they have spindlier bodies, they're slighter, they have larger, longer, yet narrower heads with pointier ears than us, longer, more pointy fingers, and they have these very recondite, almost paranoid personalities where they're always sort of looking at Earthlings, wondering whether we're going to do them any harm. Maybe that's a cultural heritage when Earthlings first went to Mars and began to dominate human activities there. Mm -hmm. That group was known to periodically jump one of our chrononauts and eat them. Mm -hmm. So we were, in our training, we were instructed to be somewhat cautious around members of that group um, because survival conditions on Mars are very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. So you can see how occasionally there would be some cannibalism, just as there are during periods of famine on Earth. I mean, in China, apparently, there was mass cannibalism during one of the uh, agricultural revolutions that was a disaster that, that Mao had sponsored. So that group was not necessarily predisposed to welcome our presence, except maybe occasionally to uh, mm -hmm. use some of us as prey. Let me get rid of this. Okay. So, and then the third group, uh, by the way, I call that second group Homo Maris Maris because we're presupposing that they're the indigenous Martians. Where they ultimately came from is as, as, as mysterious as where we ultimately came from, right? Where, where humanoid life entered the solar system, probably planted there. Uh, but then the third group are the Martian terrestrials who closely resemble the gray extraterrestrials of the UFO literature. Okay. And I call those Homo Maris extraterrestrialis because they're virtually identical to uh, to the greys. And there was an incident that I, I enjoy narrating a lot because it, it showed that my training kicked in at a certain point. We were trained to 
communicate with our fellow chrononauts across the grounds, you know, across the surface of Mars, when there was danger especially, in very, very short bursts of meaningful English. So I came out of the jump room first at one time with Courtney Hunt of the CIA and my fellow classmate, Brett Stillings, behind me, out of a jump room that we called the corkscrew because it had sort of a conch shell kind of pattern. And we would walk along this inclined plane on in a circle to walk out from the jump room up to the surface. So I came out the, the opening of that conch shell-like aperture and I saw a gray extraterrestrial up on the roof at the end of the, the conch shell, as it were. Mm -hmm. And I yelled out to Courtney and, and William, Court, Brett, a gray on the roof observing us. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, and so that was the, the only gray that I saw on the surface. Now, Bernard Mendez, who was the defense investigator of the project and also one of our fellow jumpers and indeed one of our team leaders like Courtney Hunt was when we were traveling to the surface, some of the older individuals who usually lead the team, um, claims that he was seeing uh, gray ETs much more frequently than that. I went up around 40 times, so God knows how many times Bernie went up, maybe 100 times. Yeah. I got, but he definitely reports having more sightings of gray ET-like Martians. But that one was was closely holding the, the roof as if um, as if it was more of a terrestrial than the kind of languid, you know, effortless movements that people report of ETs in the contact of it. So I believe that that's a branch of the great ET, uh, great ETs. Maybe that branched off on Mars when they intervened around 3000 BC on Earth mm -hmm. and and kickstarted human, you know, Homo sapiens sapiens uh, right. civilization. Uh, on our planet, but they look like the greys, but they're a little bit more like lemurs than that, if you will. They look a little bit more equipped to grasp the earth and branches and things and, and survive as a terrestrial species. Right, right. The thing that is, is that obviously um, humanity, uh, we've been we've been around a long time, and uh, Yes, disasters have happened, but yet, uh, and have been more advanced, even, you know? Yes, it's quite true. Um, and it's also, we have to remember that, you know, we have a conception of being earthlings, but we have to remember that, you know, the evidence now shows, indisputably, that not only are we not alone in the universe, but we're not even alone in our own solar system. So a kind of a new Copernican revolution is occurring where in the same way that the Copernican revolution, you know, following what Aristarchus of Samos in the Greek civilization determined that we are not at the center of the universe except in a relativistic way, but that indeed we, we orbit a star, namely the sun. In this new Copernican revolution, to that concept, we're adding the concept that and we're not even the center of life on this harbinger of life that's planet Earth, because the planet that is our neighboring planet every two years, the planet that comes closest to Earth as a planet, not as a moon, namely the planet Mars, is itself inhabited, and not just inhabited with microbial life form or simple life forms, and not just with higher animals, and not just with humanoids, but with different kinds of humanoids. Mm -hmm. So we have to work through a new understanding of our place in the cosmos here, in the 21st century and simply accept that and start doing the right things on Earth and then also out in space. That's my hope that if we can move through that second Copernican revolution in the 21st century, we'll begin to treat all human beings on Earth and indeed other life forms as team members exactly. on what Professor Fuller calls Spaceship Earth so that we won't tolerate war and hunger and poverty and disease and intolerance because we'll recognize that we're on this small spaceship together, and until we take care of everybody in our own civilization, we're not going to have the cosmic right to go out and participate in the greater politics uh, and the great adventure that, that space holds for us, and indeed the time space holds. So we're really going to have to spend the next several decades really getting a grasp on what President Kennedy described as the con common enemies of, of humanity and address them and create a successful civilization here so we can then take our activities outside the bounds of our planet and be trusted to do so. Our common enemies. 
ourselves. Well, the common enemies, yeah, I mean, look at, I mean, can we doubt that we're in some kind of interplanetary quarantine? Yeah. When we consider the fact that, as the great ufologist Stanton P. Friedman once observed, our primary spectator sport is vast, inter, in, uh, vast fratricidal warfare, mm-hmm. vast internecine warfare. Yeah. I, warfare is legally sanctioned mass murder. Mm-hmm. That can't impress the more advanced hominids who've been observing our our global culture. And so, in a sense, you believe that expanded consciousness, you know, in order to do that, you have to expand a, a connection, a soul connection to other other beings, other human beings. Yes. And evolve I, that way. And then it, con- intelligence opens. Exactly. I believe that, uh, sorry to cut you off there, Wayne, but mm-hmm. I, I believe that knowing the true nature of the cosmos that we inhabit is the common heritage of humankind on Earth. So I believe that these cover-ups have to fall so that we all develop the global consciousness, the planetarian consciousness, that we're simple units of human life Mm -hmm. in a relatively small planet in in an obscure part of a vast Milky Way galaxy. What is it? We're on the rocker arm of a spiral, we're on the spiral arm yeah. of, of some extension of the Milky Way, 165 million year, light years from the relative center of that galaxy. Yes. We are out in nowhere on a very beautiful planet, mm-hmm. in, in an inhabited solar system. Yeah. So if we're going to qualify in cosmic terms to become a space-faring and a time-space-faring civilization, we're going to have to demonstrate the development of a higher civilization here on Earth. And so I think that these two these two issues go hand in hand. I believe that the truth embargo needs to fall for that revolution in consciousness to flourish. And when it does, we will then recognize that we need to start treating all seven billion human beings on our planet as our brother and si- brothers and sisters and as our team members, mm-hmm. so that nobody goes without, and we're all treated as part of the cultivation of civilization here on this planet. I think until we do that, I don't think we're going to be allowed by the extraterrestrial races that have been surveilling us to go out into the wider cosmos. I don't think we can be trusted. No, I agree with you. Possessed of rocketry and nuclear weapons, why would they trust us? And they've shut those down. I mean, they can shut, you know, they can shut those projects down, it seems like, uh, in, a, in a snap. You know. In fact, I, I surveyed the newspaper records of the summer of 1947 when the Roswell crash occurred. There was clear intent by extraterrestrial crafts over every nuclear site on the planet, including Oak Ridge in Tennessee, Hanford in Washington, that's where the Kenneth Arnold sighting occurred uh, by FBI agent Kenneth Arnold, and then above Roswell, which was the only atomic equipped uh, strategic bomb bomb wing at that time, and uh, other locations. Look During the war in 1942 above Los Angeles where some of the atomic research contingent uh, was. So yes, since the late 40s, since we began the incredibly cosmically stupid thing of uh, blowing up atomic bombs which tear at the very physical substrates of the universe, yes. we've been under surveillance by more intelligent civilizations and we should really consider the, the seriousness of that fact, that our own activities in, uh, in ionizing, in propagating ionizing radiation uh, have already uh, drawn the attention of more advanced civilizations yeah. um, in our galaxy. Because what we do here happens, it's so within, so without. Yes, if we assume that there's symmetry in the universe, presumably a nuclear explosion caused a nuclear implosion across the other side of the galaxy. Yeah. So you've already put the universe on notice that you know, we're a genocidal species, we possess rocketry and now more advanced forms of transportation. And for the last 60, almost going on 70 years, we've been periodically blowing up nuclear weapons for no, for no good reason. Mm-hmm. Often for very violent genocidal reasons, as we saw at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We see the contamination now of the planet through nuclear energy and events like Fukushima. Mm-hmm. We're basically blowing it in terms of our final examination 
to become cosmic citizens. So I'm speaking out so we can become cosmic citizens. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Because um, because we need to hear. We need to hear the truth. How could I live my life just to remain alive and conceal the fact that as a child 40 years ago, I was involved in the research and development of time travel, where by 1978 modalities from conventional remote viewing on the one hand to reaching the far future via Stargate had already been reduced to practice by dark. That my father and I were rubbing elbows with some of the Project Manhattan scientists like Dr. Harold M. Agnew, like Dr. Edward Teller. I was standing next to my father in the hallway at the Los Alamos National Laboratories where he apprised Dr. Emilio Segre of Project Manhattan on the fact that we were there at the labs on a teleportation project based at Sandia. How could I hold back that 10 years later as a college student in the early 80s, we were going to an elevator in either New York City or in El Segundo, California, and the door was closing, the elevator was morphing from a box-like structure to a cylinder and then correcting itself and when the door opened, we were on the planet Mars. I mean, I thought, look, when you reach a certain age and a certain degree of life experience, you know, you've seen the Grand Canyon, you've experienced life's pleasures and its creative opportunities and its challenges. At a certain point, you have to stop clinging greedily to life so that you're making your investment in the well-being of future generations. Yes. Because you're, you're identifying not with yourself, but with humankind and its and futurity, what its destiny. And so even though I was threatened by the Bush administration in 2003, that if I didn't stop investigating, talking about, or writing about the time travel technology that I was exposed to, they, quote, couldn't guarantee my survival, which I took to be either a warning or a threat. It was probably a threat. Nonetheless, I told them I was going to shut up, and then the next year I gave my first lecture. It was in October 2004, because I thought, well, ultimately people don't matter. What matters, as, as, as Captain Jacques Cousteau said, is what matters is principles, purposes, and projects. You know, what principles do we form? What purposes do we form to implement those principles? And how do we articulate those purposes into concrete projects that help humanity cope with its need to achieve life support and to construct a sustainable civilization on behalf of future generations? So I thought, well, I'll begin speaking out even if I lose my life doing this because at least I will have died for a, a, a meaningful purpose. Mm -hmm. And so that's been motivating me as a thought that you know, every once in a while I get very dejected because I, I've received a lot of abuse from the public by those who believe that I'm lying or crazy or they're on some level envious that they weren't involved. It kind of threatens some people's ego. And I get very castigating emails and comments on Facebook that I am crazy or I am lying. And usually... Those insults um, are based on profanities and vulgarities rather than just on character judgment. And then I, maybe I'll go out shopping for groceries or something, and I see a little child. And all of the weariness from taking that undeserved contempt melts away. Because I look at a little child walking with his mother and some little two- or three-year-old, and I say, that child is going to teleport between Los Angeles and New York City and in, in two seconds to go to go see a, a, a Broadway play with their high school friends because I had the courage to speak out about these technologies being developed 40 years ago when I was there. Uh, so it's all worth and, it. And be friends with, with other races. Yes, and have the opportunity to go to a convention on Mars and meet the different typologies at a summit meeting on Mars and meet some of the young people from their culture and speak with them because the some of the Martian humanoids that are our genetic relatives on Mars actually speak English. The ones that my father and I met at that air base in New York City certainly did. Yeah. So this is what the 21st century holds for the next generations and when I can identify with those kids and the notion that let's say that little two or three year old girl is going to grow up and get pregnant and not be on an airliner where her pregnancy is going to be at risk from radiation, where she might have a miscarriage or her child might have birth defects because she decided or needed to take an airplane ride during her pregnancy, but will be able to zip through time space with minimal impacts, I feel good about everything I'm doing because I know it's going to be having a positive impact on the lives of those kids when they grow up. 
Yes. I was supporting them. If we're able to achieve global teleportation by 2020, that's only seven years away. And that's the, that's the milestone that I've set for my truth campaign, which is I hope to promote the international discourse on teleportation so that we achieve global public teleportation between major cities by 2020. Mm-hmm. At least that's the goal. But and, and, and the awareness seems to be increasing. I mean, my Project Pegasus site on Facebook, I had set a milestone of 10,000 members by this Christmas, back in um, May. Mm-hmm. We'll probably see 10,000 members by the 4th of July. Yeah. I mean, I add three people and do some law work and come back 45 minutes later. This more. More. <laughs> this more. So my truth campaign is, is taking off. I've been yeah. on a number of major television programs now, and awareness is increasing that we have the tools to create a sustainable civilization yes, in the 20th century. The political challenge is that many of the most important ones need to be declassified and deployed by the U.S. government. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be difficult, not only to declassify, but to deploy, because we're going to have to create an international system of teleports that cannot be commandeered by local national governments or military forces on the one hand, or organized groups of criminals or terrorists on the other. So there are some profound technical impediments that we're going to have to overcome, not to constructing the teleport network, but to making it safe. Mm -hmm. And so there's a major public policy challenge ahead of us for this generation uh, of political leaders around the world if we're going to implement what we can do which is create a world where teenagers in California can have their their high school prom in Paris and come home for dinner. Mm -hmm. And much more. And much more. We'll be able to, we'll be able to take a, you know, workers in downtown Manhattan uh, will be able to to go to lunch in Paris and come back to their office spontaneously. Well, thank you very much. I, I've kept you over the hour. Um, I don't know how you, you know, uh, if there's anything that you'd like to say to to everyone in closing, um, a message you'd like to leave. Yes, Dwayne. I, I would just like to reach your viewers that with the fact that I'm telling the truth, I'm standing in my truth. My facts have not wavered. They're true. They're based on life experience serving in Darkest Project Pegasus in the early 70s and in the CIA's Mars Jump Room program in the early 1980s. If you want to follow that literature, I would invite all of your viewers to join uh, join me in my group's Project Pegasus and Mars Anomaly Research Society on Facebook because that's where the very dynamic discourse about these two areas of human uh, functioning in the universe is going on today. And please lobby your national governments to contact me. I'm using an open, transparent strategy. I've always said that I would testify about my experiences uh, to the President of the United States or the U.S. Congress and also consult any other world government leaders about these time-space capabilities that the U.S. government uh, developed in the early 1970s and that we can and will be using to revolutionize human life on Earth in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you. Man. And uh, I guess we'll s- sign off for now. I'd like to interview you again sometime. I'd be happy. Uh, there's much more that I had on my list to ask you, but I never got to. Okay. Well, let's make this a regular thing. I'm just here in my law office in Vancouver, Washington. Okay. Look forward to chatting with you again. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Dwayne. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.